Hello, I'm Father Josiah Jones, the rector of Holy Trinity Reformed Episcopal Church in Fairfax, Virginia. Thank you for joining us for this adult education class. And this particular class is going to focus on the reception of Holy Communion, particularly as we have done it and will be doing it uh, this coming Sunday. Um, in a way that's rather different than the way that we normally receive Holy Communion. So if you're not a member or a regular attender of Holy Trinity, this uh, video may seem a little um, strange to you, or if you're not familiar with, with what our practice has been. Um, just so you know, our uh, uh, parish has been a weekly communion parish for quite some time. Um, and during this time of the coronavirus pandemic, we have been um, live streaming uh, most weeks service of morning prayer. On Easter Sunday, we uh, live streamed a service of Holy Communion and then distributed Holy Communion to uh, the parishioners, wh whichever parishioners wished to come in groups of 10 or less in keeping with uh, the governor's directive. I mean, groups of 10 or less, we have people sign up on a sign up genius and be able to come and to uh, receive Holy Communion. And we're going to be doing that again this coming Sunday, and uh, li likely we will be doing the same thing later in the month of May on Pentecost. So I wanted to talk a little bit about this practice, why we're doing this practice, uh, sort of the, the thinking behind it, why we're doing it in this particular way, um, and, and the way that this sort of illuminates particular things about how we think about Holy Communion. Um, and so uh, thank you for joining us as we uh, go through um, uh, this lesson. You know, there's been a lot of conversation uh, recently about what is essential. Uh, and this, of course, uh, comes from uh, the government's um, allowance of certain businesses to be open, those that are deemed to be the essential businesses or the essential workers are allowed to work, whereas other people um, uh, are not. And there's been a lot of debate about uh, what that means, about what is essential, what's not essential, how that all plays out. Um, but I think one basic uh, thing that we could say as Christians, as we think about essentialness, is that Holy Communion is a vital and a central part, we would even say an essential part, of Christian worship. We are um, those who worship God in word and in sacrament. As Christians, we worship God in word and sacrament. We receive God's word from Holy Scripture. And we also receive from God in baptism and the Lord's Supper. To help us to think about this today, I'm going to be relying a lot on uh, that most learned and judicious divine, um, Richard Hooker, a great theologian of Anglicanism from the 16th century. He's also a priest, a parish priest, and wrote a great work called The Laws of Ecclesiastical Polity. And we're going to be um, reading some excerpts from that to help us understand our practice and, and partly why we're doing what we're doing. And I'd like to begin by reading a little excerpt from uh, Richard Hooker. This is from the fifth book of the Laws of Ecclesiastical Polity by uh, a translation from a fellow named Philip uh, Secor um, called Richard Hooker on Anglican Faith and Worship on the Laws of Ecclesiastical Polity, Book 5. This is from the fifth book of the Laws. And uh, in thinking about Holy Communion, um, uh, Hooker says this, Let it therefore be sufficient for me, as I present myself to the Lord's table, to know what I receive from him, to know what I receive from him there, without searching or inquiring about how Christ performs in keeping his promise. Let disputes and questions, which are but enemies of piety, and threats to true devotion, which have been all too patiently endured up to this time, take a rest. Let curious and sharp-witted men beat their heads over whatever questions they wish. The very letter of Christ's word gives clear assurance that these mysteries fasten to us his very cross like nails. From the sacrament we draw out even the blood of his gored side. In the wounds of our Redeemer we dip our tongues and we are dyed red within and without. Our hunger is satisfied and our thirst forever quenched. 
the person whose soul is possessed by this paschal lamb and made joyful in the strength of this new wine, feels wonderful things, sees great sights, utters unheard sounds. This holy bread has in it more than the substance that our eyes behold. This cup, hallowed with solemn benediction, gives endless life and welfare to both soul and body, because it serves as both a medicine to heal our infirmities, and purge our sins, and a sacrifice of thanksgiving, while at the same time it sanctifies and enlightens us with faith, and truly conforms us to the image of Christ. Oh, it's just a wonderful passage from uh, from Dr. Hooker about the wonderful thing that we receive in Holy Communion. That in Holy Communion, God gives us great gifts. He sanctifies us. He forms us. And also, there's a great deal of pastoral wisdom in what um, Hooker says here. That when we come to Holy Communion, we're not to be uh, muddled about with trying to discern particularly which uh, minutia of theological um, understanding we have. But we're to come in trust of God's promises. To receive from God what he's promised to give. And to receive Jesus' body and blood by the sacrament as we come to him in faith. And so receiving Holy Communion is a vital part. I mean, as, as, as Hooker says, it's a vital part of our sanctification. It's a vital part of our growth in Jesus. And as a minister... My job is to provide for God's people, to be a minister of uh, the word, to teach the word, and to preach the word, and proclaim the word of God in the Bible, and to administer the sacraments, to administer particularly baptism and the Lord's Supper. Now, I also know that it's true that not all Anglicans receive Holy Communion weekly. And in fact, down through history, not all Anglicans have received Holy Communion weekly. There are many um, ministers in the Reformed Episcopal Church who I love and respect uh, who do not have Holy Communion weekly in their parishes. They have morning prayer on certain days of the month. And that is a tradition that is um, very uh, old and venerable in Anglicanism. Particularly here in the state of Virginia, um, it was not uncommon to have um, communion only monthly or to have communion quarterly even, to have it uh, less frequently. I think it's a great blessing to be able to celebrate and have Holy Communion as a weekly part of our worship. I think there's great wisdom in that. I think it's um, a a good and wise practice. But we also need to acknowledge that, of course, it it hasn't always been the standard practice for every Anglican everywhere. But even as it's not been the standard practice to have weekly communion, uh, we still see it as essential. I mean, Hooker says, um, thus we see that however men's opinions may otherwise vary, when it comes to baptism and the Lord's Supper, we may say with the, appro- with the approval of the whole Christian world that they are necessary. The first to initiate, and the second, by which he means the Lord's Supper, to consummate and make perfect our life in Christ. The sacraments aren't secondary, They're necessary. They are indeed essential. So what do we do when we're in the kind of boat that we're in right now, where we are prevented from meeting together in person by the threat of the coronavirus? And I know that uh, for many of you uh, sitting out there uh, as you're watching this video, wherever you may be, um, that uh, for some of you, you uh, hear me say that and you say, yeah, indeed, uh, the threat of the coronavirus is serious. And for some of you seeing this, you say, well, uh, no, I've looked at the numbers and are already kind of quibbling with what I'm saying. And um, I'm not going to really get into that today. Um, I'm not really even qualified to get into it as a minister of word and sacrament. I am going to uh, record a video this next week for adult education that's going to deal with government and um, particularly uh, what I think is the government's right to um, to restrict gatherings 
um, but also uh, where the government's, uh, government's rights are limited because the government does not have unlimited rights in what it does and what it proclaims. And for instance, um, the government can't tell us uh, what is essential for Christian worship. There have been some places um, in, um, in the country where they have um, allowed people to return to worship, um, to public worship, but they've said, ah, but you cannot uh, have Holy Communion. And uh, I believe that that is uh, an example of the overreach of the government. Because the government, um, even as the government is charged with uh, protection of public health, the protection of public welfare and public safety, uh, the government uh, does not have the right to tell the church what is essential for the church. The church um, has the right to, from God, know what is essential and know what needs to be done. And like I said, we're going to uh, talk more about that in the coming weeks ahead. The, the question is, okay, but what are we going to do here now? Um, I, I, how are we going to be able to receive Holy Communion? Are we going to be able to receive Holy Communion um, in this um, interim time when we are prevented from meeting together because of a grave threat? And so uh, we want to um, be able to give and receive Holy Communion, but in keeping with our tradition, and also in respecting uh, the, what our government has said and respecting the public welfare and trying to love our neighbors well by respecting um, the fact that uh, this virus is very contagious and, and can really hurt people. And so what we did on Easter, like I've mentioned, is we um, had a live stream service of communion in which I consecrated sufficient uh, bread and wine um, for all those who are going to come in time slots throughout the day to receive. And then when people would come, they had, was signed up ahead on Sign Up Genius, and when they would come uh, to receive Holy Communion, um, we would pray. Um, uh, we would begin by a confession of sin and an absolution. We'd pray together the Lord's Prayer. We'd pray the prayer of humble access. Uh, we would give the Holy Communion. Uh, there would be reception of Holy Communion. And then uh, there would be um, the, uh, the prayer, the post-communion prayer, and a blessing at the end. And uh, this practice is done on the model of um, a, a portion of the prayer book that's called the Communion of the Sick. You may not, not be familiar with that, but in our um, 1928 uh, Book of Common Prayer, um, uh, there is a, a section that gives a service to be used um, in cases where communion is brought to a person who is sick. This is on, if you have a prayer book handy, this is on page 321 to 323. And there are particular rules given um, for bringing communion to a person when they are sick. And the confession and absolution that we are using uh, when we uh, when we have the, those uh, little uh, slots of communion that people come to, come from the communion of the sick service. Um, now you might be thinking, well, gee, you know, um, we're not all sick, so why are we doing this on the sort of analogy of the communion of the sick service? And uh, we're going to talk more about that, but the, the main reason is because uh, we are prevented from gathering together, which is what um, the illness prevents a person from doing. When a person can't come to worship because they are ill or sick, they're prevented from gathering together with the public worship of God's people, which is, of course, the, the rightful location um, for the celebration of Holy Communion. Because they're prevented from gathering together, it has long been the practice of the church to bring the sacrament to those who cannot come, to those who can't come uh, for various reasons, but particularly because of illness, who can't come to worship. We even see this in the ancient church, in the patristic church, in the example of um, Justin Martyr. Justin Martyr um, wrote in the second century, and in his first apology, when he was explaining uh, to the Romans um, the practice of Christians, one of the things that he says is, after the celebration of Holy Communion, those who are called by us deacons give to each of those present, that is present in the, in the worship of the church, in the public worship of the church, um, bread and wine uh, mixed with water 
over which the thanksgiving was pronounced, in other words, over which the, the consecration was made, it was, it was uh, God uh, was thanked for the gift of the bread and the wine, um, even as um, it was set aside to be uh, his body and blood. And to those who are absent, the deacons carry away a portion. In other words, the idea was they would uh, take uh, some of the sacrament that had been uh, that had been set aside and uh, that had been consecrated, and they would carry it away. They would bring it out to those who were absent, to those who were sick, to those who couldn't come. And this is actually a, a wonderful sign. Because um, we heard from, um, from Richard Hooker that when we come to receive communion, the main thing happening in communion is we're receiving something from God. We're receiving grace from God. But it's also true that when we come to Holy Communion, there's another sign. It's also a sign of the unity of God's people. It's a picture of the fact that we eat together from one bread, that we drink together from one cup that we are together joined together in Jesus' body. And the fact that that Holy Communion is brought from the service to the sick is a sign that even those people, even though those people can't gather together, they can't come because of their illness, that they are still joined together with the same body. They're joined together with the same group of God's people. And so it's a, it's a wonderful picture, not only of, uh, and not only is it a, a, a means by which we receive God's grace, it's also a sign of our unity. And that is particularly underlined by receiving from that which has been consecrated on the same day and has been uh, consecrated in the worship of God's people. Now, this practice of the communion of the sick is something that was and has been criticized before. It's been it was particularly criticized uh, directly after the Reformation, and um, Richard Hooker, um, in his laws, uh, responds uh, to this criticism that said that um, the Holy Communion should not be um, ever brought to somebody who's sick. It should only be celebrated um, in the context of of um, of the public worship of the church. And Hooker uh, wrote this, this life and this resurrection in our Lord Jesus Christ are available to all people because of what Christ has done for us. That which makes us partakers of what is offered is our individual communion with Christ. In other words, that we're, we're members in corporate in his body, that we're, we're uh, individually joined together with him. And the sacrament of communion is a primary means of um, uh, to strengthen our bond with Christ and so to multiply in us the fruits of this communion with him. In other words, it's a primary means that God uses to strengthen our communion with Jesus. For this reason, St. Cyprian called the sacrament a joyful ceremony of speedy resurrection. Ignatius called it a medicine that procures immortality and prevents death. And Irenaeus called it a nourishment of our bodies for eternal life and preservation from death. Because the sacrament, whenever we may receive it, has such a desirable and fruitful effect, those who are so severe as to insist that everyone's circumstance is the same and that all must follow the same rules, add much pain to people with troubled and grieving minds who come under special or extraordinary circumstances and kindle in us a desire to respond to their urging that we accept them. When we have a special regard for their special circumstances in accordance with the charitable nature of the church in which we live, there flows to God that glory that his righteous saints gave him when they were comforted in times of their greatest distress. To those who have their reasonable petitions to receive communion answered, there will be the same contentment, tranquility, and joy that others before them reaped, and for which we all hope when we finally take our leave of the world, whenever our uncertain time of certain departure shall come. <laughs> 
Okay, there's a lot of wisdom, and I know that that's a lot um, uh, to digest. But the thing that I want to emphasize here is this. Because the sacrament, when we receive it, has a desirable and fruitful effect. Here he's now going to respond to those who are saying, well, we can only give communion to those who are um, actually in the public worship of the church. He says that this is severe to insist that everyone's circumstance is the same. That everyone has to follow the exact same rule in giving Holy Communion in the public worship of the church. Now, that is the primary place where Holy Communion is to be celebrated. That is the primary place where we are to have Holy Communion, is in the public worship of the church. But Hooker also is a wise pastor. He was a pastor. He, he was a pastor. He was a parish priest. As a wise pastor, he notes here that there are sometimes special or extraordinary circumstances. And the church, as we've seen, has always recognized this. The church in, in medieval and in patristic practice, and I would dare say in Reformation practice, understands that there are circumstances where people are ill or sick when they can't come to worship. Right now we're prevented from coming to worship because of, um, because of the rules regarding the coronavirus. It's a special or extraordinary circumstance. But there can be provision made in light of special or extraordinary circumstance. So the Holy Communion can still be offered to those who desire it, to those who feel the need of its desirable and fruitful effect. And that Hooker says that this is in keeping with the, what he calls up here the charitable nature of the church. In other words, the loving nature of the church. Uh, that um, those who make a reasonable petition to receive communion can receive the same contentment and tranquility and joy that comes in the reception of the Blessed Sacrament. So Hooker notes here that the church has made this, and look, the church has made this provision down through her history. We see this all the way back um, with, um, with Justin Martyr, but through history, even at times when the laity received communion very infrequently in the medieval period, there, were, there was a time when the, the laity, that is lay people who were not clergy, would only receive Holy Communion with um, very irregularly, perhaps only once a year. It was still um, the case that the clergy, when a person was very sick and near death, when they would come to them to pray with them and anoint them with oil, that they would administer Holy Communion to them as well. Because the church understood um, the, the great strengthening and the great comfort that there is when a person comes in faith to receive Holy Communion. Now, one thing that it should be noted here as we think about um, our particular practice at Holy Trinity regarding Holy Communion and regarding what we're doing is that um, we need to think carefully and, and, and very carefully about um, reservation of the sacrament. When I say reserving the sacrament, what I mean by that is consecrating the sacrament, setting it aside for the use and, and, and consecrating it as Jesus' body and blood but then not immediately consuming it. And um, this practice has been uh, of reserving the Holy Communion is something that has been done down through history. And the ancient and medieval practice, it seems as we saw um, with, um, with Justin Martyr, was to consecrate a portion and then to take it immediately to those who were sick or to those who couldn't come. They would take it directly out of the church and take it to those who couldn't be there. And this practice eventually developed into practices that would involve um, reserving the communion for a long period of time, just in case somebody would become sick. Um, and there were also um, many abuses that came to arise around the reservation of Holy Communion. Um, abuses such as um, the Holy Communion would be um, would be put into a vessel and would be put in the front of the church and um, uh, would be looked upon and, uh, and as a person looked upon the Holy Communion and gazed upon it and prayed in its presence um, the idea was that then a person would be strengthened in God's grace 
But the reformers rightly noted that this type of reservation is not something that is in Christ's um, uh, establishment or in his command of what Holy Communion is. But that we, we are to duly use Holy Communion. We're to, to take and eat it. And that Holy Communion also could be carried about all the time by a minister, to, um, uh, sort of in a superstitious sort of way. And so although the, the, the ancient and medieval practice of, uh, of this sort of reservation to take to the sick um, on the same day that the communion was given um, was something that was um, practiced um, in the first prayer book in 1549, um, when the prayer book was uh, revised in 1552, that rubric was removed, and that was largely due to those abuses and in the Reformation trying to correct abuses. So we need to think about that reservation, particularly as um, our prayer book um, in the 1928 prayer book, as well as uh, the, the two um, articles here from Article 25, Article 28 of the 39 Articles, um, seem to um, be against reservation. Look down, this is a quote down here from Article 28. The sacrament of the Lord's Supper was not by Christ's ordinance reserved, carried about, lifted up, or worshipped. So why then am I... Uh, reserving the sacrament for us to receive. Well, I think that one way to understand this reservation that Article 28 is talking about is to understand it in light of what Article 25 says and in light of these various abuses of, of reservation of the sacrament that had arisen. Article 25 says, the sacraments were not ordained of Christ to be gazed upon or to be carried about but that we should duly use them. And how do we duly use them? We duly use Holy Communion by eating and drinking. Right? By eating and drinking. And so I think that this prohibition in Article 28 to reservation and caring about is in light of the sacrament being misused in reservation. It's not by his ordinance reserved, carried about, lifted up, worshipped. It, it's not um, misused in terms of directing our worship to the bread and wine themselves, to the elements themselves, but to the Lord of those elements who uses those elements to communicate his grace to us. Okay. So I think it's a, it's a question of use. It's a question of reservation in terms of use. Are we uh, reserving for superstitious and abusive purposes or for the purpose of the unity of God's people and the reception of Holy Communion um, from uh, God's grace, by God's grace? Um, it is interesting to note that um, it does seem that in the Elizabethan church that the sort of reservation of the sacrament for the sick was at least practiced. Um, John um, Henry Blunt, even though the rubric was removed um, to allow for it um, uh, in the communion of the sick service, uh, John Henry Blunt says that there were, was a rubric in Elizabeth's prayer book, not the 1559 prayer book, but in, in a, a version of, of the prayer book for Queen Elizabeth that did allow for it and uh, he infers from this that it's quite probable that the practice of reservation of the sacrament to bring to the sick was continued because, again, of this question of use and the sign of the unity of God's people that comes when a sick person at home who can't attend communion receives the communion that everyone else had received. Right. Um, so... Our, our reservation of the sacrament in this case is a reservation that's intending it to be duly used. It's not intending a superstitious or an incorrect usage of the sacrament in terms of gazing upon it, uh, caring about lifting it up, worshiping in the sacrament itself, worshiping the elements themselves, but receiving God's grace in faith by the sacrament that has been duly ordained, that has been duly consecrated and has been consecrated in the worship service of God's people.
So this then uh, this reception of communion in this way, right, in these groups of ten, as we're doing it, is an exception to the rule. Um, uh, Holy communion is itself a public act, right? It's something that should be done in the in the worship, the gathering together of God's people. And as long as the gathering together of God's people is restricted or impossible because of illness, and by the way, even in the 16th century, 17th century, there were times. Um, during times of plague, when the public worship of God's people would be restricted or would not take place. That has happened before in history, which again we'll talk more about next week. But during those times when we can't gather together, um, this is a way, this, these little gatherings of ten, is a way of making provision for people to come and receive Holy Communion to receive the grace of God in and by Holy Communion, and also as a sign of the unity of God's people, that we together are members in corporate, in his body. Uh, John Henry Blunt. Uh, so this is a, a great a book I'm very thankful to have. It's a, a big book here. You can see uh, it's called The Annotated Book of Common Prayer uh, by John Henry Blunt. This was written in the 19th century. Um, it's a massive book of learning um, about um, about the prayer book, about the services in the prayer book, about theology. Um, and, and, and Blunt uh, gives, um, there, there's a rubric in the 1662 prayer, uh, Book of Common Prayer that says this, In time of the plague, sweat, or other such like contagious times of sickness or diseases, when none of the parish or neighbors can be gotten to communicate with the sick in their houses, for fear of the infection, upon special request of the diseased, the minister may only communicate with him. In other words, what it's saying is that um, th it is possible for a person to receive private communion, for just the person to receive communion with the minister as the only other person receiving communion. In other words, the, the minister would go to the sick person, the person who has the plague or the sweat or any other like contagious disease, and bring them communion, perhaps consecrate communion for them, or bring them communion to bring the communion to them, and that that person would receive the communion, but then the minister would also receive the communion. Because the minister there is representing the church, is representing God's people in giving the Holy Communion in that case. Because again, uh, the Holy Communion is a public act. It's a communal act in addition to an individual act. But Blunt, very interestingly, you know, he says, um, when you may have to do this, ministers, he says, there are several things you should keep in mind, both for your health and for the health of the person that you're coming to see. Again, this is in the 19th century. Blunt says, um, you should avoid visiting dangerous cases of illness when you're in a hurry with a stomach that's empty. He says you should eat something first before you go. Um, he says, um, don't place yourself between the patient and the fire. Because he's saying, you know, when the air is drawn to the fire, the air from the infectious person will come to you. So he says, don't, you know, be careful where you go when you're coming to, res to, to administer the communion. He says, uh, don't inhale the breath of the patient. Don't keep your hand in contact with the hand of the sufferer. And then he says, avoid entering your own or another house until you have ventilated your clothes and person by a short walk in the open air. You are morally bound to take this precaution in respect to other sick persons whom you have to visit. And in the case of your own family, although they must abide by the risks which belong to your calling, they have a claim upon you for the use of all lawful precautions in making that risk as small as possible. And then it also says, in times when you are much among infectious cases, use extra care to keep the perspiratory ducts of the skin clear of, obs of obstruction. Now, what Blunt is saying here, right, is um, the minister has a duty to bring communion to people when they're sick. If they request it, uh, th there's a duty upon the minister to bring communion. And that has long been the understanding of the church. And that is why I have said through this pandemic that I will meet with you and bring you communion if you request it because it's my job. It's my duty. It's, it's why uh, one of the reasons, uh, it was one of the things I was ordained to do, one of the things I was set aside to do, is to minister the sacrament to God's people. But notice what Blunt says. That doesn't mean that you go willy-nilly. You take care, 
to avoid infection, both of yourself and to protect other people in the church who you might go to see. And that's why um, in our um, giving of communion, we have modified our practice. Right? I, I use hand sanitizer between each group of people. I wear a mask when I get within six feet of people. Right? So as not to breathe on anyone. And when I place the host on somebody's uh, tongue, I use hand sanitizer in between to make sure that I'm not passing any breath right, or any contagion, any virus, that is to say, um, from one person to another. We're also only giving communion in one kind or by intinction in most cases. So uh, again, to limit um, the, the contagion, to limit, to limit the possibility of people um, passing from one to another, um, the, the illness, we're asking people to stay six feet apart right, to make sure to limit the contagion right? because we want to be wise in how we manage this and how we manage um, the giving of the sacrament. This is in keeping with what the church in her wisdom has done before. We're seeking to keep with that, with what wisdom the church has done before. Okay. Now, um, it is understood that when a person comes to receive Holy Communion, that the person has attended the, the service of the Word that day, that they've heard the preaching of the Word. Okay, they've heard the word read. Because rightly understood in our theology, um, the preaching of the word and the administration of the sacrament go together. Those things go together. right? And when I uh, will uh, uh, bring communion to a person who is sick, um, if they have not that day been able to hear the word of God, I will read the, read the word of God to them, which is a type of proclamation of the word of God. right? It's a type of preaching of the word. It's the reading of the word. And so I read the word of God to them before giving them communion. And we also have a confession and an absolution. This is in keeping with um, the way that this has been done down through history. So um, one, um, uh, this book here, the Book of Common Prayer, uh, this is a commentary on various parts of the Book of Common Prayer, says that um, when the communion was done, um, the, the um, on a day when the communion had already been celebrated and the elements consecrated, a shortened service of confession, absolution, distribution, and thanksgiving takes place. If communion had to be provided, especially for the sick, a reduced rite takes place with a curie, the epistle and gospel, followed by the canon, that means the time when the uh, elements are consecrated, um, at which time the elements are consecrated. Right. So the, the, what we do when we have that confession and absolution in, in, right before receiving communion is in keeping with what the church has always done with that. That's why, one of the reasons why we're doing that. And we also remember when we come to communion, we do commune with Jesus in and by communion, as Hooker so eloquently said. But we also remember that we commune together with the church, or at least the minister on behalf of the church as the representative of the church come to the sick person's house. So we're receiving um, on this, um, not, uh, of course, as people who as uh, are knowingly sick, but as people who are separated from one another on this analogy of those who are sick, right? That we join together in these little groups, even with the, the appropriate social distancing, we join together in these little groups that we might come and receive the grace of God. One thing that's important to keep in mind here, too, is that God knew, when, when God established the Lord's Supper, he knew that there would be times of plague. Um, God knew all about germ theory <laughs> when, this, uh, when Holy Communion was given to us and was established. God knew what caused illnesses. And I think it's important for us to keep that in mind as we think about um, the fact that he has established this for us. He's given this sacrament to us as a great gift. That God knew uh, that there would be illnesses. He knew that there would be plagues. And that we're not to fear then as we come to Holy Communion. Again, we're, we're not to fear even if we might become sick. Now, we have a duty, like Blunt reminds us, a duty to try to protect other people, right? 
we have a duty to, in love, try to make sure that we don't spread contagion to others. And we have a duty in love to try to protect one another. Which is why we're going through this social distancing. But if we can manage it, and I think we've found a way that we can, it is wise for us to come together to receive the Holy Communion. Now, it may also be that for some of you, you don't feel comfortable coming out now. You're in a particular high-risk category um, where uh, you may uh, become ill and, um, and it may be very, very serious for you. And so the church also has provision for you if you cannot come. And that is this reminder, this rubric that's on page 323 in the prayer book that there, is, there may be due in, or just impediments to coming to communion. You see here this just impediment, impediment. And that the minister is to instruct those who can't come to truly repent on their sins, to steadfastly believe that Jesus has suffered death on the cross, has shed blood for his redemption, to earnestly remember the benefits that have been received thereby, to give thanks for that, that that person spiritually eats and drinks the blood, body and blood of our Savior profitably to his soul's health, although he doesn't receive the sacrament with his mouth. Now this spiritual reception is, is not the same, but it is a comfort that Jesus in grace has communion with us even if we can't come to the Holy Communion. And so we should rest in that great promise, that great hope, that Jesus is good, he's the Savior, and that indeed he makes provision for us knowing all of the situations that we may find ourselves in. And so, dear brothers and sisters, uh, we're going to be receiving Holy Communion this coming Sunday. Some of you probably watch this after you receive. Some of you may watch it before you receive. And I pray that as we come to Holy Communion this week, that we would come uh, in humility, that we would come in faith and hope and love, that we would come repenting of our sins, truly repenting of our sins, and looking to our Savior Jesus to receive the grace that he so freely gives. If you have any questions or comments, I'd be glad to discuss uh, this uh, presentation with you more. May God bless you and keep you.